Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your Tuesday morning with us. My name is Max, and this webinar is entitled To Strive, DECL Writers in Conversation, the first in a series of online roundtable discussions that feature DECL's most eminent alumni in celebration of the department's 111th founding anniversary. To formally start this webinar, I'd like to introduce a very special person for our welcome remarks. Dr. Judy Celine Ick is a professor, award-winning author, actor, dramaturge, and the chair of the DECL. She obtained her PhD from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst as a Fulbright scholar and was also an Asia fellow and visiting research scholar at the University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. She is the country's premier scholar and one of Asia's top experts on Shakespeare. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Judy Celine Ick. Hello, good morning, and thank you for um, being with us um, this morning for uh, the first in our series of um, commemorative webinars. Uh, this, the webinar series is called To Strive, To Seek, To Find, and Not To Yield. And if you're an English major, you know where that's from. Um, our first webinar here today is To Strive, which features some of our best writers that are products of the Department of English um, and Comparative Literature at UP. Uh, this webinar series was conceived not only to celebrate um, the DECL, which turned a 111 years this, this year, uh, one of the oldest departments in the university. Not just to celebrate that, but also to share with our students just how long and illustrious this tradition is. Um, this department has been the cradle for many writers, artists, critics, movers and shakers in Philippine society. And this webinar series is a way to just celebrate that, let our students know what this tradition is. And more, more than that, for the department as an institution to participate in crucial public discourse, since we now have public venues like Facebook and webinars and things like that. So um, I won't keep you much longer. Tune in for this, tune in for the rest of the webinars, as today we listen to some of the finest writers in English this department has produced. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mom Judy. Uh, before we go to the main event, here's a quick overview of what's going to happen today. Our moderator will be giving out prompts. The questions were actually publicized earlier on this week. Uh, she will be giving out prompts to facilitate the one hour roundtable discussion. It could actually go on beyond one hour, depending on um, the questions the audience members also ask among our speakers. As the discussion is happening, audience members are encouraged to ask questions via the Q&A button at the bottom middle part of your Zoom screen. Should be down there. Uh, after the roundtable discussion, there will be an open forum in which our speakers will be answering your questions. Speaking of moderator, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marie Aubrey J. Villaseran. She has a Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts in Creative Writing from the University of the Philippines and a PhD in Sociology from La Trobe University, Melbourne, Australia. Most recently, she is the UP Center for Women's and Gender Studies Deputy Director for Research and Publication. Her research interests include creative nonfiction, literary ethnography, gender and migration, feminism and coloniality. I now give the floor to Dr. Marby Villaseran. Thanks, Max, and good morning to everyone. So let me just introduce you to our stellar cast this morning. Hemino Abad, University Professor Emeritus of Literature and Creative Writing, is a poet, fictionist, and literary critic and historian with various honors and awards. In 2009, he received Italy's Premio Feronia for his poetry, later published as a bilingual edition. Um, Dove le parole non si spezzano. Sorry, Sir Jimmy, if I'm butchering this. Selected poems from In Ordinary Times, Poems, Parables, Poetics. Where No Words Break, New Poems in Past, in, uh, published in 2014, is his 10th poetry collection and Past Mountain Dreaming in 2010, his ninth of critical essays. He has two collections of sto short stories, Orion's Belt and A Makeshift Sun. He's also known for his three volume anthology of Filipino poetry in English from 1905 to the 1990s, Man of Earth, A Native Clearing and A Habit of Shores. 
and a six-volume anthology of Filipino short stories in English from 1956 to 2008, Upon Our Own Ground, Underground Spirit, and Horde of Thunder. His latest work is the Achieve of the Mastery, the sequel anthology to Habit of Shores, published by the UP Press. Gina Apostol, our second um, discussant, grew up in Tacloban, Leyte, in the Philippines, and lives in Western Massachusetts and New York, where she writes her novels on revolution and language, power and translation, storytelling, and history. Her most recent work has focused on the Philippine-American War and acts of narration as form of invention and liberation. Her fourth novel, Insurrecto, was named by Publishers Weekly one of the, as one of the 10 best books of 2018 and selected as an editor's choice of the New York Times. Her third book, Gun Dealer's Daughter, won the 2013 Penn Open Book Award. Her first two novels, Bibliolepsy and The Revolution According to Raimundo Mata, both won the Juan Laya Prize for the novel. She was a fellow at Civitella Ranieri in Umbria, Italy, and Emily Harvey Foundation, among others. Her essays and stories have appeared in the New York Times, Los Angeles uh, Review of Books, Foreign Policy, Gettysburg Review, Massachusetts Review, and others. She, she teaches at the Fieldston School. Jose Delisa Jr is Professor Emeritus at the University of the Philippines, where he also served as Chair of the Department of English and Comparative Literature and Vice President of, um, for Public Affairs. He has authored more than 30 books since 1984, with six of those books receiving the National Book Award from the Manila Critics Circle. Among his numerous books are Sarcophagus and Other Stories, Killing Time in a Warm Place, and Soledad's Sister which was uh, actually shortlisted for the inaugural uh, Man Asia Literary Prize. So in 1998, the Lisai made it to the Cultural Center of the Philippine Centennial Honors List as one of the 100 most accomplished Filipino artists of the past century. Among his distinctions, he won 16 Palanca Awards in five genres, including the Palanca Hall of Fame in 2000, five Cultural Center of the Philippines Awards for playwriting, and FAMAS Urian Star and Catholic Film Awards and citations for his screenplays. He was named one of the Outstanding Young Men of 1993 for his creative writing. He has been a Fulbright, Hawthorndon, David T.K. Wong, Rockefeller, and British Council Fellow. Whew, that took maybe 30 minutes for me just to introduce the list of achievements um, of our speakers for today. So um, let me not uh, dally. They will be answering the three questions. They will be giving a short kind of talk, answering these three questions. So first is, how should the Filipino writer write in a time of a global health crisis and under the threat of an authoritarian government? Second is, what is there particularly to strive for and to strive against in one's writing now? And the final question is, should one be compelled to do some work of notable note in these ignoble times. <laughs> All right, um, tough questions to ask really um, and to answer. So let me, uh, let me introduce you to our first person to answer these tough questions, Jimmy. Yes, um, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, we, we call, uh, any literary work, uh, creative work, no? Yeah. Uh, no matter what kind of short story or what kind of poem it is. Yeah. Uh, to my mind, uh, uh, I would rather call it imaginative work. Yeah, imaginative work. Yeah, you know why? because um, it is the imagination that makes real to the mind what the mind perceives or intuits. So it is the imagination that creates what is real to the mind. Yeah? So that's why to think well, is to imagine well. Yeah. When is a short story successful? 
a short story is successful, no matter what kind of short story it is. It is successful when the writer of the short story has imagined it well, so that the experience that is represented there comes real to his own mind, to his own imagination. He has imagined it well. And therefore, it will be easier for the reader to imagine it as well. Okay? Now, that short story or poem is work of imagination. But it is also work of language. And there is the difficulty. Because it is as though you were, because the short story or poem is not written in any language. It is wrought from a language. It is as though you reinvent the language. So all that I have to say now is because it is the imagination that creates our future, then all that a writer must do, any artist, not just the writer, any artist is to do his work <laughs> as artists. Yeah. yeah. You know, if our people, it is, it is our imagination that creates our future. If our people still imagines that do dirty is a very good dictator, we will have the next future is another dictatorship. You think you think so? Huh? If that is how our people imagine do third is the government, then we will have the same government next year. That's it. It is the imagination that creates our future. Okay, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay, so imagination kind of plays a very key role, no? I'm, I'm thinking of Benedict Anderson's imagine, imagined communities lang, wherein you, you know, what you imagine actually constructs your reality, no? Well, the famous na ano ngayon is most of social, social life is actually constructed, or most, most of life is actually a social construct. All right, thank you, Jimmy. You know, yes. I will add something. You wouldn't have advanced technology if there were not people of imagination. That's right. Yeah. And who dreamed of these things first, no? Yeah. So what we can um, what we imagine actually um, has repercussions for how the future will play out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, next we'll have uh, Gina. First of all, um, I just want to say, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I just want to say it was, um, it was hugely pleasurable to um, listen to Jimmy, uh, to Dr. Abad, as I called him, and I, I've always called him for a very long time, to Dr. Abad talk about um, the imagination again. I took a class in poetry with Dr. Abad twice, because I had to one. <laughs> I always told Dr. Abad, I'm here under, um, uh, under coercion because all I wanted to do was write fiction. But the genius of the program was that you had to do, I don't know if it's the same, but if you were a, a as they called it, imaginative writing uh, major, you had to do all, you had to do all. You had to take two poetry classes, two playwright classes, two, um, two nonfiction classes and two fiction classes. That's what was required of writing majors. And so I remember that comment by Jimmy a long time ago. And it, it really has um, stuck to me when he, said a, when he said a poem is a poem when it says it desires to be a poem, which I, it sounds really, sounds really, um, sounds like a tautology, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about that you know, how, what that means for me. So thank you, Dr. Abad. I'm going to say I didn't really prepare for the 10 minutes um, 
I, this is kind of informal because I'm really more interested in the questions that people have. And I'm interested in what others are interested in knowing. And I'm very interested in the conversation I will have with Butch and Dr. Abad, with, with Butch and Jimmy. Um, and I'm going to be honest, um, when presented with the questions that you had for me, I felt I had no good answer because it seems to me there's only one. My answer would be what we do to write in these ignoble times is sit down and, and write. Um, and yet my singular answer I know very well is problematic because each of us has our different lives. I can only speak for myself on these questions. Um, and, and I will say I did um, finish a novel during the pandemic. Um, I accepted all the books. People asked me to blurb. I wrote four forewords, one for an anthology, one for a novel, one for, uh, two for uh, books by academic um, writers. I also taught remotely. So I've been very busy and it was good to be so busy during these times. Um, but every day, what allowed me to live through these moments, which are moments of political terror in both of my countries. You know, living through the Trump election, you know, living through that election was just terror. And um, the, of course, living through vicariously, yes, um, the Duterte terror, the news of activists being slain, imprisoned, abandoned to a terror state, and of course, the world of the pandemic. But all I wanted to do through all these hor horrific times is finish my novel. I wrote, I spoke earlier um, in the year when Karina Bolasco asked me to talk about writing during the pandemic and it was a very personal one. But I'm gonna talk here about um, this particular novel that I ended up doing. It turns out I was writing a novel about my mom. Originally, the novel was called William McKinley's World. It was about two brothers in the Filipino-American War. One's a revolutionary, one's a, a collaborator, and there's, someone's going to kill someone. So it was very much a novel about war and history. And I ended up, during the pandemic, completely changing this novel and just writing about mourning my mother. So my mother becomes enclosed completely embedded and structures um, this work um, that actually is also a work about history. Um, and it, 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 I've been thinking about why during the, these times I would, I would go there. Um, when I write a novel, the way I write a novel is I always have a constraint, what I call a constraint. So Insurrecto had a constraint. The constraint of Insurrecto was Every major, every page almost had a mediated content, something that you could look into another text and, there, and, that, and, and it's part of another text. This one had a constraint too. So this novel is currently, it used to be called William McKinley's World, it's now called La Tercera. Um, this novel's constraint was something I simply don't do. Every single major event, incident, had to have something real in it. I do not do memoir. I do very little nonfiction. As Jimmy Abad knows, I don't do poetry. <laughs> um, my interest has always been fiction. And not only that, my interest, has, my interest has always been the writing of novels. So novel form has been my overwhelming pleasure. Um, it truly engages me. I'm constantly thinking about the form of novels, whether it's my novel or other people's novels. So to write about so-called real things um, was really strange. Um, and so one thing I'll say about that, I, I can go into that a little bit with the questions. So I think what I'd say in these times, how to write, what to write in ignoble times is to write what means something for you, what's meaningful for you. I don't think we should be afraid of what's meaningful for us personally in a time of global threat. I guess maybe what I've learned in this time of seclusion is that all of us can only be ourselves. We can only be and think and speak for our own selves. I think it's because during the pandemic, we were so attuned 
to our bodies, to the survival of our bodies, to keep alive the things that we are, ourselves, our families, our loved ones, the people close to us. We recognize that keeping those close to us alive was all we could truly control. And it was our job to keep those bodies alive. And that narrowness, that refining of our lives only to things and people that mattered was in fact the noble thing. It was an important thing for each person to do. To do the right thing by our bodies was in fact useful for society. It remains, you know what it is in the United States right now where people who are not, not caring about their bodies and not wanting to get vaccinated. So I'd say find what's meaningful, zero in, find the core and figure out a way, both in the novel or the work of art, how to make the writing happen. Um, that's a, the strategies for keeping a novel going are a different topic um, that I can talk about later. Respect that choice you made, give it its due. Respect yourself and the demands of your body and the demands of your life. Respect what's meaningful for you. Now, one might say that this piece of advice that I have is cliched, it's trite, but I also think that in the choice that I made to write about my mom, there is actually political significance. Because here's the thing, who's my mom? She isn't even from Tacloban. You know, I grew up in Tacloban, I grew up in the city. My mom comes from a teeny tiny town inland in, the, in, in Leyte. Even the people in Leyte will laugh at that town that my mother is from, Barugo. They call it Pula Pula Tae Town, red shit, red shit town, because it's famous for its, um, um, for, for tuba, we're famous for tuba. It's so trifling and small, but um, I decided that the world should know the story of my mom's town, Barugo, the, that the world should know the story of Tacloban and of Leite and the story of my mother and put it within the world historical um, story of my novel, the novel of Philippine history. It's also a story about class. I'm always thinking about class because, and the reason why I'm always thinking about class, by the way, is because my novels really do come from the UP. My novels are very much formed by my time at the university. There were two worlds that I had at the university, the world of Kalayaan, my dorm, my freshman dorm, and the world of the department. And those two worlds, a very hermetic world of English literature that was my world at the English department has been seminal and really important in that formation of how I think about art. And the fact that the English department, the English department made me, made me read everything so that when I, so when I went to um, Hopkins for grad school, I was, I was very weird because you don't do that anymore. You didn't do that in the 80s in the United States. Um, whereas I, I, I really read everything from Beowulf through, well, it was only up to T.S. Eliot, but, but the, you know, whatever. Um, <clears throat> and the other one was the world of Kalayaan, which is the world of politics, the world of Marxism, Maoism, and political engagement. I will say that they, the world very rarely came together. <laughs> the English department was not the world of politics, but the melding and the, um, the joining of those worlds with my world of Tacloban and trying to figure out my world of Tacloban, the world of the province with the world of the city um, and the dual world that I had in Diliman was, has really been, been important. You have to understand, every single novel practically that I've written has had something to do with Diliman and with the English department. I'd say bibliolepsy, I'd say gun dealer's daughter, I'd say, well, Raimundo Mata had a lot of Ateneo, but there's still Estrella Espejo in Raimundo Mata. And Insurrecto, um, the world of Magsalin, the um, pre-world, pre-New York world of Magsalin is UP. So, I, I just want to point this out. Um, the political act of centering um, this experience, to say to a reader, trying to figure out a country like the Philippines matters. 
That's what I'm doing. A revolution, in my view, had world historical significance. Rizal is a world historical figure. And the more we try to center the Philippine world, try to move the world historical relevance of the Philippines into that intellectual world conversation, I think the better it is for the world. Recognizing the centrality of your own experience is the only way you can make art that in fact is global. That is important to the concerns of a global audience precisely because our world is unknown. And what people are recognizing right now, especially in the United States, I'd say, is that what they do not know hurts them. If you do not address the concerns of climate in a country like the Philippines, you will not solve the concerns of climate elsewhere. If you do not address the issues of oppression, imperial aggression and violence and history, that is the capitalist way in a country like the Philippines, you will be unable to see why the rapacity of the Western economy is untenable. Ignorance of the reality of a country like the Philippines is the seed of destruction elsewhere. It is not sustainable for the world to be ignorant of the history it has made. So writing about my mom is a political act. But at the same time, I know why I did it. Because I am mourning my mother. The personal matters. That's all. Thank you, Gina. Wow, that was um, so moving. Um, it just reminds me of, you know, how prior to the pandemic, most things have been depersonalized, you know, through corporate culture, extrajudicial killings, which has mostly rendered people as numbers or either cogs in a machine and kind of um, people scoffing at um, writing about what's personal and saying, you know, you're, you're, navel ga you're navel gazing or, you know, are you that important? But um, as you said, the personal actually matters and the per talking about the personal actually um, decenters from you know, um, colonial powers, if, you, if you'd like to term it that way, because much of marginalized identities are scoffed at, right, as well. Um, so, you know, uh, going back to, you know, what feminists say, the personal well, actually is political. Just when I say, yeah. at Lubanon, hmm. it's not marginalized. My world is central. Hmm, that's right. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Gina. Um, we'll have, uh, now we'll have Butch. Okay, thank you, uh, Marby. Magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. I, I actually had a, a very short essay uh, uh, written about this, this general topic of, uh, of writing under, well, un under all kinds of pressure especially a, a political and now uh, even uh, uh, a totally another kind of pressure. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just read that and uh, I'll raise a lot of other points uh, in, the, in the open forum. Uh, this is a very short essay titled Art and Disorder. Uh, it's become a commonplace to say that bad times <clears throat> produce good art and maybe so. The one great example that comes to mind is, is Picasso's Guernica, made in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War. The story goes that Picasso was in Paris working on another commission when he heard, he heard about the fascist bombing of, of Guernica in April that year, whereupon he shifted his attention to producing the now iconic anti-war painting, which he finished in five weeks. Another great and oft-quoted story is that of the uh, Russian composer Dmitry Shostakovich, whose Symphony No. 6 in C major, which came to be known as the Leningrad Symphony, was premiered in Russia during the siege of Leningrad by the Germans in July 1942 and became a kind of anthem of Soviet resistance. In the more cinematic retellings of this episode, it is said that the Germans realized they would lose the battle when they heard the symphony being played by a ragtag band of Russian musicians on the radio. 
On the German side, there's a story of the Berlin Philharmonic persisting in recording Brunhilde's immolation scene and the finale from Wagner's Götterdämmerung, despite the Allied forces knocking on Berlin's gates in April 1945. Now, these examples with their heroic, if not tragic overtones, seem to suggest that in periods of great disorder and distress approaching chaos, artists of all kinds rise to the occasion and summon up their finest talents uh, in the service of, and here one is tempted to say humanity, but I'm more inclined to say order, which is inherent in every artist. The desire for justice is a form of outrage over the disturbance of some natural equilibrium, some sense of fairness, and bringing music into the battlefield is a willful imposition of structure and narrative into the cacophony of war. These creative outbursts in the middle of the fray are also affirmations of one's higher consciousness a civilized rejection of the easier option to submit to brutishness. This reminds me of Umberto Eco's insightful description of how art works, and I quote, as a minimum of order compatible with a maximum of chaos, unquote. The artist's impulse is to bring method into the madness to see pattern and narrative in the mess of things. Sometimes art has responded to war in the most striking ways. There was a very close relationship, for example, between cubism and the development of military camouflage in the aftermath of World War I, with cubism providing the inspiration for the abstraction of natural forms culminating in the so-called Dazzle, the A-Z-Z-L-E ships. And, and I urge you to Google this term, Dazzle ships whose wild geometric designs by the marine artist Norman Wilkinson were meant less to hide ships than to confuse U-boat rangefinders. For all of these examples, however, I will propose that, at least in, in our field, literature, but possibly in these other arts as well, crisis and chaos are not the best environments for great art, not just because the artists are too busy just trying to survive, but because it takes time, distance, and reflection to integrate, to reorder, the experience of falling apart. This current pandemic will surely be the stuff of both bestsellers and ponderous novels, but the best writing about it will very likely not emerge for many more years, if not decades to come. Returning to my initial reference to war, the best war stories were written long after the wars they dealt with. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy about the War of 1812 came out as a book in 1869. World War I's All, All, All Quiet on the Western Front by Erich Maria Remach was published in 1929. Kurt Vonnegut's World War II era Slaughterhouse Five in 1969 and Tim O'Brien's Vietnam era, The Things They Carried in 1990. Take also three of the best known works associated with the idea of a plague. Daniel Defoe's A Journal of the Plague Year, which was about the bubonic plague that hit London in 1665, when Defoe himself was only five years old, was written more than half a century later and published only in 1722. Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Mask of Death, which was published in 1842, was not even based on an actual plague, but was rather highly allegorical. Albert Camus' novel, The Plague, came out in 1947, but looks back, looked back to an actual outbreak of cholera in Algeria 
in 1849, almost a century earlier. And the, flat, uh, the fact is that the plague itself is never the real subject of literature. It is what it does to people to bring out both the best and the worst in them. The plague is merely the backdrop or the trigger for the exposure of human greed, corruption, and indifference as much as it can provoke nobility, heroism, and, brute, and humility. This is also how literature has dealt with war beyond journalism and history, which are concerned with chronicling and interpreting the facts. The best war stories from the Iliad onward deal with human character under pressure. Now, I have no doubt that the time will come when we will see a substantial body of Philippine literature emerge out of this pandemic. Novels, stories, poems, essays, and screenplays that will remind readers of the future of what it was like to live in 2020, in 2021. And it won't be just about COVID and lockdowns, but OFW, Stockholm, Netflix, K-drama, Lala Move, and Donald Trump. And of course, uh, Digong. <laughs> In a recent exhibit of works meant to address COVID, uh, the painter, Filipino painter, Juanito Torres, takes us through many of the tropes that the past, this past year of lockdowns ha uh, has embedded in the Filipino psyche, chiefly that of the physician as hero and savior most strikingly portrayed in a painting titled Dadat, Darating Din Ang Bagong Umaga, a painting steeped in iconography, the doctor sprouting angel's wings, standing victorious over a demonic virus and holding a cross that also serves as a staff of Asclepius entwined with this healing serpent. It's Saint Michael the Archangel uh, treading on Satan's dragon in another work, Lupang Hinirang, Rizal, Bonifacio, and the other heroes are dressed as doctors raising the Filipino flag, like the Marines on Mount Suribachi in, in Iwo Jima. While there's a possibility of sardonic humor in these overblown, overblown depictions of heroism, the more troubling likelihood is that enemy of good art Cliche. Bad times invite posterization where subjects can either be romanticized or demonized. In the meanwhile, thanks to the politics of populism and the slippery pervasiveness of social media, the truth is being replaced with insistent assertion and control of the narrative is on top of the political agenda. If you claim I won and he's bad a thousand times, some people will begin to believe it, more than some. In a sense, the most daring kind of fiction now is out of the hands of creative writers like us. It is being created by political propagandists who are spinning their own versions of the truth and to expect people to believe in them. The short story and the novel are for me no longer the best media for this type of fiction, but the tweet, Facebook itself, uh, the Facebook feed, the YouTube video, and even the press conference. The conspiracy has emerged as the most popular genre of this new fiction. The idea that people are out to fool you or cheat you, but they can't because you have a more clever version of the truth. COVID and fake news may be the most dangerous combination yet. But as I've been saying these past few years, the best antidote to fake news is true fiction which will be up to you and me to write. 
And now after all my caveats about writing under pressure, let me end by offering up a poem that I wrote a few months ago after a number of our friends died of COVID one after the other. I suspect that, that poetry is, is actually more responsive to the moment because a poem, even if it talks about the past, always proceeds from the present. And this is a poem I titled Intubation, uh, wondering what it was like for someone to be intubated and uh, basically uh, saying goodbye without being able to, of course. Here we go. I would love to be hungry again, to pine for rice noodles laced with fish and shrimp, even if my nose tells me they're a day too old. I would love to be bored again and watch crickets nibble at the scraggly grass or notice paint chipping off my bathroom wall. I would love to be enraged again by gross injustice and niggling vexations, taking deep, deep breaths to quell the rumble. I would love for my heart to be broken again and drown in the stream of loss and despair, only to resurface, gasping for air. Uh, thank you very much. This pandemic no, has caused grave such great loss para sa karamihan sa atin. Thank you much for sharing that. Um, I, I was just uh, thinking about what you said that most of the great work about partic uh, you know um, particularly challenging times for for people actually for in, in fiction anyway they um, they come out years later and. Uh, I remember kind of um, attending one conference wherein uh, a person was talking about um, World War II. And um, they talked about how people dealt with trauma there. And the reason why people were only able to talk about it like years after is that it's only years after that they are, they are able to reflect on the chaos um, and yeah. systematize it enough to actually create a narrative to make meaning out of the seemingly meaningless things that happened you know, they they couldn't they couldn't understand why it was happening right so it was only years later that they were able to process it and i'm thinking about how you know um books uh uh, martial law continues to be a topic even until present for people, for most writers, no? um, if not directly talking about martial law, then kind of um, still <laughs> harkening back to, um, to the traumas mm -hmm. of martial law. No? Um, so I expect nga in a few years, um, <laughs> maraming ang lalabas rin about this pandemic because really, um, grabe yung epekto um, sa mga tao nito. Okay, thank you for that. Um, are we ready to start uh, answering questions um, from, from our audience? Um, first uh, question that appeared in the Q&A is, um, so uh, from the, uh, Daniel Malantik, how can we surpass the limits of our imagination in this current time where it feels like the scope of what we can imagine is constrained by the lack of real interactions we have with others and the world around us. That's that's the question. I'm trying to. So without that real interaction, kind of, you know, the face-to-face -face one instead of just the virtual interactions, um, how can like, how can we imagine things? considering that lack? Well, uh, if, if I may just jump into that, uh, I actually like the lockdown for, uh, <laughs> for the fact that I don't have to interact too much with the, with the world outside. Uh, I, I think my, my imagination works better that way, uh, uh, away from things and, and finally getting the the, the time and space to, to write. Uh, 
um, you know, there, there's a time to be just living out there. And, and of course, that's very important to every writer. Uh, you know, life, life comes before writing and life gives you experience. But there's also a time for introspection and just to just sit down all by your lonesome and peck away at that keyboard. And we've had a lot of, of, of time for that now. I mean, it, it may be a horrible thing to say, but uh, at least for me, uh, I think the lockdown has been actually good for my, for my writing because I don't have to interact with, uh, with the world at large and things uh, have come much sharply into, into focus uh, this way. It's probably different for others. Jimmy, yeah. I think this is referring to you because of the idea behind imagination. I think you're, yeah, you're raising, your, you know, you're indicating you'd like to know, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it is very important for the writer to, as it were, rediscover language because that is his only medium or means of expression. Now, um, when you write, you, you work the language like the farmer works the soil to produce his crop. Language is already a given. When you are born, you're already uh, born into a language. Uh, the language is a given. If you look up the word gif, <laughs> gif, no? uh, if language is a given, it is free. No? It is a blessing. It is a grace. It is already there when you are born. It is a given. No? Okay. But if you, if you think about language, you look at the dictionary. It is a wilderness. It's a wilderness of meanings. Correct? That's what I mean. When you write, you work the language. It is as though it is as though you are uh, renewing, <laughs> giving life to the language because language by itself is dead. No, no. The word evokes an image. The image lights up its meaning. Work of imagination. No, you say tiger, tiger, burning bright. Tiger, tiger. No, you imagine the tiger. Correct. No? Tiger is tiger is tiger. It can be nothing else. But you have to imagine it. Correct. Yeah. So. That's why writing is work of imagination and work of language at the same time. They are working in concert. And the, and the imagination, by the way, has no limits. Uh, no limits. It is, it is your power. It is your own power. Uh, but the only important thing is you're able to reflect. What do you mean reflect? You go inside yourself. You keep quiet. You listen to your own spirit. You listen to your own spirit. You look up the word psyche in the dictionary. It will tell you psyche is consciousness. Spirit. What is real, it was real, is what is real to your consciousness. Therefore, what you call reality is always and forever a human reality. What is real, what is true, what is just, what is right, what is wrong, that is how you imagine it. There, your consciousness is your reality, your psyche. Uh, there, yeah, you are on your own. And I think essentially, whether he likes it or not, the writer is, or the artist, is a loner. 
Yeah, he's a loner. He reflects. When you reflect, you're alone. Yeah, you're a loner. <laughs> Too bad for I, you. You don't like to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that applies to Butch yeah, who doesn't like, who I know, prefers the, the isolation brought about by the lockdown. <laughs> and I guess, um, um, Jimmy, no, uh, what, what will happen is that language will, some, some words will change in meaning because of this experience of um, yeah. being in lockdown and isolation. You know, um, you know, I should like to add, Bala, the language you are born into is the consciousness of your community. Yeah? The language is the whole body of your country, of your community. Yeah, Tagalog, Cebuano, Kapampangan, etc. It is the embodiment of a consciousness of that community, Kapampangan. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, thank you, Jimmy. Um, Gina, I think you, you wanted yeah, to say yeah. something a while ago. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. I, yeah. My comment on that is just very kind of practical. I think, I think um, for me, what's really—I mean, what what's—it's—it's it's really useful to read um, and to <clears throat> learn um, about the world, about how human beings um, exist through books. Through re for a writer, reading is really—I think really reading is really central. So. Um, Exercising your imagination through the reading of books um, is, for me, a very practical advice that I'd give to that to that writer. Um, the other thing is that when you're interacting, because a lot of people are right now interacting online, when you're interacting online, look at the online world in terms of how things are being for structured. Um, try to conce try to conceptualize um, what the you know what Jim is saying the, the community the community that's being produced in the Cebuano world etc and think about it from the point of step back from it and see if you can find tropes types um, as you're as you're saying new words what are the words that are coming up and um, and study study. Study that online world, for instance, from the point of view of someone who's going to um, create something out of it. So in a way, for me, what's interesting about the online world is that it, for a writer, <laughs> for a writer, it's research. I, I actually read comments on stuff that I hate. And I, I read comments, I, I, will, I will open up the comment section of people that I know are going to be really crazy. Because for me as a novelist, those things are, you know, as my teacher used to say, grist for the mill. They're part of my research for all the, for, for the work that I'm doing, which is trying to understand how humans exist. What are, the, what are the social relations? Why are these the social relations? How are these connected to um, the reality that, um, the political reality that's being produced? So... Mm -hmm. I just see everything. To see the whole world, however you're interacting with the world, as grist for the mill. That's what John Barth used to say. Everything is grist for the mill. Everything is for your mill. Um, if you're a writer, everything is useful. So reading is really important. That's what I did during a lot, a lot, a lot of the pandemic. Um, and study uh, the languages around you, as Jimmy's talking about study the way people are are speaking and figure out you know why are you speaking like that everything is research i want to add something to what gina is saying you know uh, reading the love of reading is very important for any young person especially because it is reading that develops the sense, the sense for language. And the sense for language, the sense for language is the basic poetic sense, the basic creative sense. Huh? 
Yeah, that's how important reading is. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, if I say the language is the body of a community's consciousness, that means that with words and words, the writer can change, even transform a community's consciousness with language. Uh, language evolves. Language is, cha is changing. That means the consciousness is also changing, right? Yeah. And that has okay. to be done by, re by listening closely to other people. L listening mm -hmm. closely, like listening closely to how Jimmy is, is producing those sentences. Listening mm -hmm. to others. I think reading is important, but I don't know, Gina, how you can read through all those comments. Sometimes they're not just grist for the mill, but they can be a cesspool as well. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, really, uh, everything is always double. Yeah. As your, um, as your heart rate is going up. Yep. <laughs> the amount of, of things that you'd rather not read. My eyes, my eyes sometimes is how I, um, what I feel when reading through them. Uh, okay, uh, on to the next question. So this one's for Gina. Your novels have always made, uh, this is from Lily Rose, um, Lily our Rose. former chair, Lily Rose Tope. So your novels have always made good use of history. If you were to write about the Duterte regime, what do you think would be your focus? If you were to write about the Trump regime, what would be your focus as well? So will it um, will writing about, for example, Trump, will, uh, have, will it have a Filipino angle? an interesting question. Thank you, Lily Rose. Um, uh, will it ha have a Filipino? You know, what I, I guess when I think about um, when I make my choices um, with the novels that I've done, they haven't been about, I'm going to write about Duterte, or I'm going to write about this. They've been more or less about a way in which contradictory things, I, I need to figure out contradict, something that I don't understand. That's basically, um, that's how uh, a novel comes, comes up. Um, so um, if I were to write about the Duterte regime, my focus would be the contradiction, the, the question that I have about um, the Duterte regime. And I have many, 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 many questions about the Duterte regime. You know, as, as you can imagine, we, we wonder why we have the Duterte regime. Um, so um, about the Trump regime, um, I'm so uninterested in Trump. You know, I don't even think about him anymore um, since he's not the president. And um, I, would, I don't think I would write about Trump if it weren't from a Filipino angle. So I, I, from, from an angle that makes sense to me. Otherwise, I, I don't think I would write about the Trump regime. I'm, I'm so uninterested also in America, in, in American, what America considers important. I, I find what America considers important really kind of dumb. A lot of it is um, uh, kind of white supremacy idiocy. And that is even when it comes it's even true of their smartest people. I mean, the people to read right now in America are really black people. It's really the African-Americans. They're, they're the ones, and the uh, feminist lesbians. Um, they're, they're, they're amazing. Um, feminist lesbian Marxism. That's, that's actually, but, but the, you know, basic American intelligentsia stuff um, maybe reached its peak in like, 1870, you know, when it went downhill after Reconstruction. After the abolitionists, America became stupid. That's a fantastic, I don't know, last line, America became stupid. Um, uh, how about you, Butch and Jimmy? If you were going to write about the Duterte regime, I mean, how would you go about it? What would be your focus? Will you be writing about it, Butch, for example, mga 10 years from now uh, or, you know, in retrospect? Um, 
have you thought about have you thought about it as well? It's uh, it's something that I've dealt with uh, quite a bit in in my nonfiction. You know, writing more editorially. Mm. Uh, the, the fiction side will probably follow uh, down the road. Uh, and it will be from a street level view. Uh, I, uh, I do want to uh, say, if, if, if not kind of announce that I am working on, on a new novel. Uh, you know, I had a third one at the back burner, but, but uh, I'll just let it stay there because something is uh, breaking up my interest more at the moment. You know, the, the other day, I, I, I think I tweeted about this. Uh, uh, the other day, I, I nearly died, literally, because I, as I was driving, uh, you know, this, this truck came hurtling toward me and rolled over again. And I was stuck in traffic, so there was no moving. And it stopped just a few feet away. And uh, I, uh, I kind of took that as a, as a sign that, uh, you know, you're 67, uh, you should be, uh, you know, there's, there's gotta be a couple more novels in you and you better start today. <laughs> and literally that day uh, and the same afternoon, I, uh, I began work on this, on this thing that I've had in my mind for, for a long, long time. Uh, all I'll say about it is that it's uh, it's set in in Manila just before the the bombs fall on uh, on December seven or December eighth, and uh, it it stops there. So it's really an it's really a, a love letter to uh, to pre war nineteen thirties Manila. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm something of an antiquarian buff and I have tons of books. You know, when they were talking about reading, I was thinking that, you know, much of the reading I've done under lockdown has really been, been history and not, and not just history of the past hundred years. I'm building up a storehouse of, of accounts of voyages of discovery and, and travels to, to the Philippines 1700s, early 1800s, and just looking at things with with with, with foreign eyes, and um, and I'm I'm the older I get, the more fascinated I become with with the past, because as I've sometimes said, uh, contrary to the impression that we are headed toward the future. <laughs> We we're actually headed toward the past. That's 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 where you and I will all belong uh, very soon. So I might as well get used to it. <laughs> and and these old books remind me that it happened. It existed. And this is and they also provide me the comfort of knowing that something about the past will survive when I'm gone. So I'm in that frame of mind right now. And I suppose in a way it's. It's an escape from the present, but of course, when you write, whether it whether you're writing about the Manila now or Manila in 1936, uh, it's really all about the present, uh, the continuing present. Uh, so I'm not worried. I mean, I, I, uh, in a sense, I will be writing about Duterte, uh, but. But uh, from the just using a different time frame or, or 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 framework, but the same things will be there, and I'm happy. Okay, thank you, Butch. Jimmy, would you like to add something? Okay. Okay. All right. So let's move on to. Uh, yeah. what, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, Gina, go ahead. Lily Rose. Lily Rose, here's something that comes to mind. This is how I would think as a novelist. I would think about 1987 and the fact that around that time, 
Duterte became the OIC of Davao, okay? Um, around that time, Leandro Alejandro was killed. You know, the, the UP, um, he was so important to me as a student um, in the UP. Around that time, Cochise Bernabe mm. died. Now these are these are people who why now my question would be why is it that Duterte is the one who becomes president? Mm. These are these three people, Cochise, Bernabe, Leon mm. Alejandro, they could have been, I mean, Cochise was groomed to be president. Mm. Leandro Alejandro would have been an amazing president. But the president that we got is Duterte. So that's how I would think about writing a novel. That question that I have in 1987. Mm. You know, who was around? And what, 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 and, and knowing what happened now, what would you do with 1987? Billy Rose, that would be my answer. One of the ways that I would think about um, Duterte as a novelist. Yes, and, and just to add to that, if I were to write about uh, this regime and the present, I would, I would again take it from the point of view, from a pedestrian point of view, which would be that of, of that rarity, uh, a good cop. <laughs> Who gets uh, entangled in this web of, uh, of of murder around him? So, so what do you do? And also, I would look into complicity into uh, in uh, among ordinary people. Uh, you know, upper middle class, lower class. Uh, what what makes a DDS person? Uh, and I think that that's the real story here. It's, it's, you know, Duterte, you can't do anything about him anymore. But what, what created this phenomenon? Uh, so I would look at it as a base and, uh, and write about that. Okay, thank you, Butch. Um, a good follow-up to the discussion we have here so far regarding writing about um, the Duterte regime no, is how do you explain the seeming ir irony evident in the fact that the, the regime displays a stunning lack of imagination? So you have that one mononarrative of drugs, right? Everything is about drugs um, to control the narrative. So what happens when imagination actually comes up against the material production of narratives. So you have the narratives on FB, on Twitter, um, etc. Uh, on social media that, you know, um, Gina, you were talking about reading through the comments and Butch, you were talking about how these were producing their own narratives, right? That may not be reflective or may not even be indicative of, of, um, of what's really going on. <laughs> Let me just say it was Judy who asked that question. <laughs> See, she's waiting yeah. over there. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, one, one thing that, that we should point out, is, as I often pointed out, is that uh, in a sense, we novelists, fictionists, and, and, and poets. Uh, even under the, this regime can actually write with impunity because, um, because governments are basically illiterate. Uh, you know, it's the journalists who get killed. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, what, what I'm, in effect, what I'm saying is, is that uh, this despotic uh, uh, re, uh, regimes uh, are not that sophisticated when it, I think, when it comes to creating narratives because they, they really thrive on, on very simple messages that they just keep repeating. They don't have to be more, more sophisticated than that. The, the, the drug story, while you and I are bored to death about it, uh, you know, uh, I, I suppose resonates with, with a lot of, of other people out there who also use it to justify their own uh, dispositions. Um, uh, 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 I, I, I mean, I do not look to, to the regime for imagination. Uh, I'm not saying that they're dumb either. It's just that they have this, the, 
they have very, very sophisticated operatives yeah. uh, working with very simple messages. Sure. Getting, and that's precisely, what I, I, that's precisely what I'm saying, Butch. It's like, you know, it's so nice to listen to writers like Jimmy's beautiful speech about the power of the imagination. And of course, you're preaching to the choir. And of course, I absolutely believe you. Um, but then it's interesting to think about the role of narrative in our national life. Right. Um, how this simple, you know, even basic narrative has really taken over. Um, and so where is that faith coming from in our, baka naman it's English major faith lang na. Of course, books will change the world. It changed mine. Diba? Um, I don't know. You know, I don't know. That's why I'm, I'm trying to sort of put them together in my head. Yes, Jimmy. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, I, I'd like to add that Perhaps because we are in we are in UP, no? We are in the university, and supposedly uh, as teachers, uh, we 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 train. Uh, we yeah, we train our students to be critical in thinking, right? Now, therefore, what I am saying is, it is entirely possible that our our education our system of education is to some extent, to some extent, no, I'm not going to exaggerate, is to some extent a failure. Yeah, a failure. No, there is a failure in our system of education. You know, we have not been very good, the government in general has not been very good to our teachers. You mga teacher training program, you mga yung mga salaries nila, and so forth and so forth. Uh, no, I think we have to do something about our education system. No. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if I may boast a little uh, about my wife. <laughs> yeah. It, it's an NGO. Mga nanay. No? Mga nanay ito. No? Uh, they, they, they help the nanay. You know what they're doing now? She has a staff. Uh, they're all over the Philippines already. Uh, they are they're helping out the nanai to think about the next election. That's what they're doing now. No, yung consciousness ng mga nanai, they, they don't understand what taxation is. They think that the government is doing well by them. Nako, you know, you have to go down to their level, speak their language. Hindi, hindi na English. Eh. Uh, kung Tagalog, Tagalog. Kung Cebuano, Cebuano. Ganon. No? Uh, we, have, we, have, we have lots of work to do before this coming election. Yeah. The consciousness is not there. The consciousness of what is real. Uh, yeah. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pero very important nga yan, no? Uh, I, I think I forgot for a moment na ano nga, parating na yung elections, no? So, it's very important that we try to kind of um, counteract if we can, no? Um, in, in now, now, ever much we can, these messages. I know as, as teachers, parang we try to do that. Um, pero nga, yeah, we try. Pero siguro, um, that brings me um, to a question as well. Na in this present political climate where people seem to be suspicious of the intellectual elite, actually it was used as diba, the narrative for winning ni Duterte, part of it. No? Parang being suspicious or saying na parang we're bayaran, right? Yung mga intellectual elite or we're all just trying to maintain whatever power and position and money. My God, if you're teaching in UP, you know that you don't have money. How can writers um, engage the public, right? How can how can we how can we kind of make our own disconnection eh? um, and and suspicion uh, of 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 people who are experts and practitioners or um, researchers. So um, have you thought about this? Have you pondered this, for example? I mean, part of what you, we produce as writers, because we expect that people will read them and then learn something from them. But what if they don't read them because they're suspicious of us, right? Well, and suspicious. Uh, I mean, well before Duterte 
we, especially those of us writers in English, uh, already alienated ourselves from the mainstream just by the use of, of this language and, and the, the middle class experience that it, uh, you know, that it carries with it. So we are really not in conversation with, with our people. And, and that's a fact, I think, that uh, we are uh, dealing with. And uh, I'm not saying that if you write in Filipino, you are necessarily uh, closer, maybe to some degree, but, uh, but it's not just the language. It's, uh, it's the mindset that, that's embedded in it. Yeah. So uh, uh, the, 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 the Filipino writer, uh, I think over the past hundred years has, has really retreated uh, into academia, at, at least where we are. And, and we do not write about the things that concern most, uh, most ordinary Filipinos yeah. or not enough. Yeah. Uh, and uh, while the solution is, is obvious, it's not, uh, it's not something you can just prescribe and, and make happen because uh, we all write from, you know, from, from different founts. <laughs> And, um, but, but that's an observation that, that I, uh, I, I must make. Uh, yeah. uh, there is a huge divide uh, between us and, and the people out there. To some extent that's being mediated by, uh, you know, uh, when we assume other, other roles, when uh, I, I've also said, you know, if you're a writer today, you're looking at at least two choices if you want to be engaged. Uh, number one, of course, you write, you write the novel or number two, you tweet. And, and some of us are also engaged in that, you know, in, in this literally word for word uh, uh, kind of skirmish, but, uh, but that's really not, not the job of literature, uh, and 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 I really am bothered by by that fact that that my work has to be translated or transformed into something more popular to to get to uh, to my ideal audience of of hundreds of thousands. And maybe that's what's driving me now to, in this novel I'm doing, I said, this has to be a novel that if I were to, that can be scripted into a movie tomorrow and, uh, and create far more impact than, than the novel itself uh, will so that it can be appreciated by, by more people. Yeah. Um, Siguro, Gina, I'd, I'd like to ask this question of you as well, because you have the unique position as well of writing in the Philippines and writing in English. No? Um, and then but wanting, of course, to connect with the Filipino audience, with their realities as well. So what comes into play? Um, I mean, what do you consider uh, when you write your... I know you said that... It's also the personal. Pero since you're kind of disseminating this to a wider public, there's always that knowledge that there, you have this audience in mind to read your work. No? So what are the considerations? Um, yun na, kasi you're writing in English and then you have, uh, you're trying to connect with Filipinos and then Filipinos um, are suspicious no? of, of, of the intellectual elite. Na. Or do these actually come into play when you... When you when you write your well, book. I would say the suspicion of the intellectual does not come into play in the work that I do. Um, it, it is not, I have these, this thing, <laughs> these things that I just, I call them troll topics. Troll topic, troll topic. And I think that's a troll topic for me. It's, it's not something I can solve. 
it's not something that um, I think it's something that maybe, for instance, something that I do, for instance, uh, when someone is doing work that I think will hit um, in ways that uh, I think our activists um, can radicalize others or can, as you're saying, um, open up. Um, it's not the work that I'm gonna be doing because uh, I just recognize the kind of work that I do. Um, I will help those people. Um, I wrote the foreword to um, the work of uh, edited by Christine Ong Muslim. Um, I try as much as possible to, uh, to, you know, I mean, to, uh, I, I, I admire, for instance, very much what Ching B. Cruz does um, with her, with her work, um, with the, uh, with the OFWs in Hong Kong. And, um, and so I, what I, what I do is I make myself very open to the world of workers and other, other, other workers of art that are doing work that I think, um, but maybe my voice can help in any way, maybe it won't. But I'm, I'm very, I make myself very open and I want to know about that work. I was talking about this with Nefertiti, for instance, Nefertiti Tadyar. Um, we're, we're actually neighbors, so she's just on 16th and I'm on 12th. Um, and the work that Nefertiti is trying to do also, which is um, trying to figure out how in Ilocos she can do some work where she's kind of leveraging her work as a scholar in her town in, in Ilocos. So there are other ways that, my, that I, I think about uh, or wish to be part of a conversation that is not necessarily the novels that I do. I have to really understand. Basically, I understand what my novels are. And I do not pretend that my novels are going to transform anyone. Um, my novels are, I think about my novels mainly like, for instance, Noliedo, uh, But for the Lovers. He wrote the one novel, <clears throat> he, I think he wrote some others, but how powerful the effect of Noliedo has been on me. And who knows all these other people that may have been affected by Noliedo. I will give respect to what Noliedo has done for me. Maybe some of my novels will affect others. I cannot, I can't um, uh, legislate, regulate how people will read my work. But what I can do, and I think this might be something um, one might think about in the English department, is because the English department is more institutional. And I think that institutional voice of the department is really important for the Filipino as opposed to the writer but the institutional voice of the department that will open up and provide and carve out the spaces for all of those languages, for the regional artists, for the, you know, um, Antonino there, Nino's talking about climate change, you know, all of these different um, issues that, that really are, are prime for our, um, for issues of change. The institutional work of the department might be interesting there. You know, how do you open up those voices? For me as a writer, what I do is, you know, however I can help um, and just admiring really the work of people who are ama doing amazing work on the ground. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Gina. I very much admire Ching B. I I mean, also her poems. <laughs> mm. Yeah, um, I think Ching B also does a lot of activism together with um, with her writing, and it feeds into her writing as well. Also, really important, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of understand all the people in the department or in um, in the UP community that um, that are pushing for a more political engagement yeah. for the department. So Judy, ano, as a as a whole department, yan. 
stemming from your question, we're given a task, right? Okay, um, so moving from yung more national, wider audience into um, our, our, you know, um, a more focused audience. So we have this question. What have your most recent interactions with young students, writers, and readers been like? What do you think is unique about their generation's experience with language and narrative? How does the criticality and consciousness that emerge from their reading and education clash with the current status quo? Thank you very much. So this is from a from an anonymous attendee. Could you repeat it? Sorry, just uh, so uh, yeah. So what have your most recent interactions with young students, writers, and readers been like? So what has it been like um, being with young writers, students, and readers, your most recent interactions? Um, and what do you think is most unique about their generation's experience with language and narrative? So young people, I guess it's asking about the younger generation, Generation Z, but Generation TikTok, um, and their experience with language and narrative. They're, I don't know, they're the digital natives as well, I think. Uh, that is well, I teach very young students. Yeah, that's addressed to me, the question. Uh, uh, anyone can answer. Uh, yeah, because I have very little interaction with the, the young the young people because to begin with I am uh, what I, I call myself Neanderthal low tech <laughs> so I have very little contact with young people uh, other than the fact that I'm a loner watch <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gina I think um... Gina, you were saying that you're actually uh, yeah, teaching a lot of young students. Yeah. But my students are American. Um, I do. I have. I do get um, questions from my website um, from Filipino readers, and I think they are quite young. And um, I find also the Filipino readers who will um, engage with me. Um, Really, I find it interesting. They um, they want to know the meaning of things, so they want to know what's what the meaning of my paragraph or the meaning of the book, and I find that very interesting. Um, uh, the 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 generation of kids that I'm teaching right now, so they are very TikTok oriented. They're digital natives, but at the same time, they're politics. Is, is fabulous. They are, um, they are a lot more angry than a lot of older people um, when it comes to issues of racism, um, issues of, they're very, very interested in, their, in, the, in the ways of presenting or conceiving their sexuality. Um, they are very um, aware of the difficulty of trans lives. Um, they believe, a lot of my students who are very wealthy believe they're Marxists, which is really funny. Um, uh, so, and I do teach at a, at a very liberal school in America. Um, so, but they do give me hope that this interesting digital world that they're in is also, can also be a very political world. Um, and so I, I, I like them a lot. I like these young people a lot. I think there was a recent article, a study that came out that, that um, Generation Z is very politicized and very, and I know, Parang strong yung activism sa kanila, especially um, with issues of, ano rin, of climate change. I think they're very. We have Greta Thunberg, di ba? Um, for so what? So one thing I that I have to teach them, you know, given their, I have to teach them that actually reading Heart of Darkness is still a good thing. Because <laughs> Heart of Darkness, race. I mean, I had a class that said, no, we cannot read Heart of Darkness. It's racist. I said there are other things 
besides the racism and heart of darkness that are interested. And you can know it, but you can analyze it now too. I mean, kind of talk of to your dad up. student saying, wanting not to read, telling me we don't, we do not believe it is correct to read this book. And you know, I just say, you know, this in, in all my years of teaching, this is the first time that I've had children wanting to censor their education. Mm. So ah, I think that's interesting. Those are the two things that you're looking at. That the politics is very correct, mm. but the reading has to be has to be. Um, equally, I think it, the reading has to be Catholic, you know, Catholic, small c Catholic. You have to read everything. Mm -hmm. That's what I teach my kids. Mm. Butch, I know that you teach, I know, mostly MA Nama graduate level courses mm -hmm. with us, but um, of course, do you still consider them young? You've been in generation Z, and I think they're young. Mm. Um, would you say, um, how has your interactions, uh, how have your interactions with them actually, um, parang, how has it been? Um, what are their particular interests? Do you feel that they still, um, that, do you sense a change from you in your many years of teaching from students then and students now, let's say? Well, uh, I have to say that I think uh, my, my best students for, for some reason or other uh, were those that I, uh, that uh, I taught uh, maybe uh, 20, 10, year, uh, 10 years ago. And, and I don't, maybe it's just that I haven't, uh, I haven't, taught that much to see a, a kind of a generational uh, identifier in, 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 in my most recent students. You're, you're right when you, when you say that they're very politically uh, aware and, and as ever their, their problem is uh, transforming uh, their politics into, into art. And, uh, and realizing that it's not simply a matter of saying, uh, okay, let's, let's write a story about climate change. <laughs> it's, it doesn't work that way. You know, one of the first things I teach my students is the difference between, between the essay and fiction and how fiction works through, th through concrete, things, uh, but also through indirection. Uh, and, uh, and that's not easy for, for people to, to, to pick up on. Uh, and I guess again, uh, as Gina and Jimmy were pointing out, it, it really goes back to a, a grounding in, in reading, uh, reading all kinds of, of things and not simply the ones that make you happy or make you feel right. Uh, it's, you know, one, one more thing that I, just because of this opportunity to say this, uh, one more thing that I tell my students is that for me, uh, the, the challenge to every writer today is really to, is really to find hope and to, uh, and to create a credible narrative that will yield hope at the end of things. Because the easiest thing to write is another story of, of misery and despair. And, and that's not new anymore. Uh, what I would like to construct, and, and this is the challenge to my imagination, the imagination of, of, of hope and, and how, how you can logically lead to it if you, if you just look at, at things in, in certain ways. Uh, and, and, and that for me is, is a, a, a pressure I, I personally feel. Uh, I'm not talking about Polyannish uh, resolution, the Deus Ex Machina, and things like that, but 
but, but stories, fiction that will remind me that despite everything, uh, life is worth living. Uh, and that's hard. Jimmy, would you um, care to add? Uh, yeah, uh, go. Yeah, what, what, what Boots just said uh, reminds me of what Franz Arciliana in any writer's workshop would, uh, would uh, practically shout <laughs> as an advice to the young writers. All he says is, get real. That's what he says. Get real. Get real. Yeah. Get real. Now, meaning to say, the experience that you have in your poem, even if it's only a thought as an experience, the experience you have in your story, make it come alive with mm -hmm. words and words that you use. There, no, get real. That's what the writer has to do. <laughs> get, it has to come, it has to become alive, real in your own imagination before it can get real on paper with words and words. Yeah. What do you mean with words and words? That means you have to work the language because the language is a wilderness in your consciousness, in your dictionary. <laughs> you have to work that language to make that experience come alive. That's your, that's your job as a writer. No, 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 no. Jimmy, that, that reminds me, of, I was watching a movie on Netflix last night and there was this great line that I'm going to steal uh, uh, at some point or other. And what I, what I remember is that it said, all true stories had some lice in them. <laughs> and it's so true, you know, uh, we, 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 we have to, uh, you know, the, the, the lies that, that we, we, we create are, are, are part of, 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 of these truths that, that, uh, that, we, that we want to get to. And, and, and that's our business. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're nearing um, 11, 11, 11 p.m. 11 a.m. Sorry, not really a morning person here. Um, 11 a.m. And we're about to, um, to end our program. I was tasked to do a sort of synthesis of everything. But I think I'd rather um, mm. that our three speakers today kind of end with... Um, since this is a celebration of DECL turning 111, no? so how does um, how did your experience of being what was like, I need to formulate this well. Um, <laughs> what was your vision of self while teaching in the de in the department or being part of the department? No, para um, as a teacher, for example, what was it that you wanted to impart to your students, and then after that. Um, maybe how do you see the DECL turning out in the next 111 years? So now the 11 years <laughs> of the DECL. Wow! <laughs> this, this is bloody scream in the background. Oh! So yeah, and parang, um, what was your vision of self while well, being in the DECL? And then how do you see the DECL kind of turning out um, in, in, in later on? Jimmy, yes. Uh, you know, uh, in the Basa English department, you have English 1, English 2. Right? What is that all about? Uh, that is all about the sense for language. No? If you are in the department of Filipino, they have to study Tagalog also, Filipino, as the national language. No. Therefore, they, they study the language itself to cultivate the sense for language. You know why? You know, if you think about it, we are our words and all our words speak true. 
A rose is a rose is a rose, said Gertrude Stein. What else is it but a rose? A rose is a rose is a rose. All our words speak true. Therefore, the authentic human being is the man of his word. That's the authentic human being. Huh? Duterte, are you a man of your word? Yeah, that is the authentic human being, a man of his word. We are our words. All right, that's it. And the English department is responsible for that. Grabe yung task. Judy, note this down, ha? Things to do natin sa department. Gina? I just want uh, something that has always um, come up for me in my experience of the department was um, my English, actually you bring up English too. I think it was, remember that reader, was it Dado Falsa who made the reader, Butch? Yes. Sino yung gumawa ng reading? Dado Falsa, reading and writing, was it? Yeah, perceivings, perceivings. Yeah, that was, and I, I think, I keep returning to so many things in that, and the and the fact that 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 collection was so big, so broad in its different in what she brought, what what the group of editors brought to that book. Because I remember, I remember there would be, for instance, Salvador de Madariaga, you know, um, the Spanish historian. There'd be there'd be um, Tagore. There'd be. Uh, Aldous Huxley, I, was, I still remember Aldous Huxley usually, what's that? Usually destroyed. That essay usually destroyed by Aldous Huxley. Um, and so, so it's so many different kinds of things were in that book. And as a young uh, student coming into, I was around 16 or so, into the department, given such plenty, and given such seriousness to address that plenty that my students, that my teachers presented to me. Um, it was, I mean, I still used, usually destroyed in, in Insurrecto. I used something that I had read in English too in my last, last published novel. Um, uh, so I think it's important for the department to recognize how important the choosing of works is. And the Dufaza was a beautiful chooser. Um, very eclectic, um, really global, uh, had boys and girls. Um, there were, I mean, if we had studied them as um, issues of sexuality and LGBTQ, they would have been in there. But I think those are things that are going to come into those texts now. And so being very open to that, um, that beautiful globality, uh, plenitude that uh, was required of us. It was required of us to engage with those things. So I think that was really important. The other thing is um, uh, for me is that um, I was fired by the English department as a teacher um, um, because, uh, well, because the department was stupid. But apart from that, <laughs> it was an error on the part of the department. But uh, do the you mean the GEC, Gina, or <laughs> the ASC or the GEC? Which part of the department? <laughs> no, but here's the thing. Um, I, I really understood intensity as doing the work that, you know, I, I really took to heart the kind of passion that the writers that the department taught me offered. And I didn't care about um, the department structures. Um, so that's very interesting to me about the department that um, it, cared, it cared about its structures. And I think that's, that's good. It's good to care about your structures. And at the same time, to think about the ways that always, I mean, I, as you know, Judy, 
you know, the whole CSC is very important to me. Criticism, self-criticism. So I'm trying to figure out um, that, that, that dialectic of um, institutions. So always being open and alert to um, the ways in which an institution um, structures are both um, uh, an aspect of the rigor that grounds the child, but as well um, to figure out when um, that when that rigor must apply to an acceptance of change and political radicalism. I think the I think radicalism was part of the tradition that I got from, in fact, the discipline of the reading that I had to do. But it was, but that radicalism came from the university itself, from the world of politics that I was engaged in. And it was beautiful to me how the department, in my view, as a student, gave me that freedom to be radical. And it's partly because the discipline, it, it was a lot. I read everything that I was told to read. I didn't go to class, but I read everything. Um, and my teachers were, here's weird, here's the thing. They were so nice. I didn't go to class. And then afterwards they gave me a one. That's so weird. Um, but um, they were in many <coughs> ways, um, <coughs> they were very caring, they were very nurturing. I still remember, um, she died though, so I don't wanna talk about it. Anyway, so just beautiful, nurturing people who were, who were, who were looking out for their students, I thought. Thank you, Gina. Butch? Yes, I- Still teaching with the department now, so. <laughs> well, I- I entered uh, the department as a student, as a uh, technically uh, uh, a returning sophomore in 1981, uh, when I was 27. And people like Judy and Gina were my, were my batchmates then. And I was like 10 years, at least 10 years ahead of them. Uh, you know, for, for most of my life, um, maybe until the present, to some extent, uh, I've always been involved in what you might call the, the dark web of, of writing. Uh, began as a propagandist for, for the left and then uh, a writer for, for the government under martial law because I was employed at NEDA, a speech writer for politicians, a, a biographer for the rich and famous uh, that, that sort of thing. And uh, then I went to Silliman's, uh, to, to the Dumaguete workshop, and, and I, I suddenly discovered, uh, you know, just the beauty of, of, of literature. Uh, again, I had entered UP as, uh, in 1970 as an engineering major, Philippine science. And so I decided to re-enroll after, after Dumaguete. And I chose between history and English. Uh, and I said, dito na lang ako sa English at mas madali kong matatapos siguro ito. It still took me three years, but uh, those were some of the, of the most wonderful years of my life because I felt that I was exploring uh, a, a, a a wonderful uh, universe of, of, of things that, uh, that my other kind of writing didn't really uh, expose me to. Uh, my favorite subjects were, uh, were with, with a Professor Ventura, uh, you know, of Philip Sidney, the Sonneteers, and, uh, and then later uh, Dylan Thomas, uh, you know, his poetry would just keep running through my head and uh, being, being around people like, uh, of course, like Franz Asiliana, when I had a new story, I would slip it under his door and 
<laughs> you know, and, and, and wait like a puppy uh, for him to say something. Uh, and uh, in other words, uh, I, I, I felt that I was kind of uh, paying restitution or, or, or saving my soul uh, by, by getting deep into, uh, into literature and, and creative writing. But a lot of that fascination really just began with, with, with imbibing uh, uh, language, uh, some of which I could not understand, but which, but which felt like just reading it ennobled me in some way. Uh, and I, again, I'm talking about uh, about uh, 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 those sonnet, those uh, English Renaissance poets, uh, and uh, and and the playwrights that I continued to study in in in, in my graduate school. Uh, it's it's a, it's a strange uh, influence, but uh, just seeing how how words. You know, in the days before special effects, how words could transform uh, uh, a stage, a blank stage, into something else. Uh, I think that that hooked me for life. Uh, I, I never did become a a, a scholar like uh, like Judy, but uh, but it was really that that brush with uh, just wanting to bury your nose in in old books and, and reading one play breathlessly over lunch because you had, you had to discuss it in the afternoon in grad school. Uh, that's the kind of, uh, of, of unique pleasure that, that you, you never find anywhere else but in departments of English. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to add something. <laughs> Go large, Jim. Ah, Jimmy yeah. pala, sorry. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, yeah. She both reminded me, you know, during those days, uh, no, Judy, during those days, uh, the, the Falsa, mm -hmm. Ramas, Arvisu, uh, Albert, Asuncion Albert, uh, and so forth, you know, they were called, they were called terrors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They were they were they were strict. No, they they demanded excellence. No, of thinking and writing, they were not harsh. No, 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 they were not harsh. Yeah, but they were no. Talagang they will. <laughs> they demanded. You know. Do you know what is the motto of UP? You know. I, I don't know if our students remember what the. What the motto of the UP as a university, you know what it is? Honor and excellence. Honor and excellence. Oh, don't you think that's a fantastic motto? Yeah, we should put that in Malacanang. Yeah, honor the, and excellence. The honor is the harder <laughs> part. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for ano, those last, pag sinabi ko namang last words, parang, ano na, thank you for those very inspiring words. I think um, it's very important to acknowledge yung transformative power of, be, of you know, um, being part of the UP experience and being either a teacher, a student here, um, or both. Um, but then, as you know, like most superheroes say, no, parang with great power comes great responsibility. So we must also acknowledge the responsibility we have towards um, kind of um, what um, influencing or let's say kind of um, socializing people into what they can imagine and what they can be and what what is. So. Um, I think it's pretty important that we're aware of the nuances of language, um, how language is produced and how we can change language as well, and how to put Filipinos and the Filipino experience at the center 
um, and not just um, you know Filipino in a Manila centric way, but including all the different cultures um, in the Philippines, right? And then to acknowledge as well the kind of the healing and um, remembering that comes really important even decades later when writers talk about um, very difficult experiences that they've gone through and in a very personal way because we've said nga, that the, the, the power of literature is not because it kind of, um, as I said, parang depersonalizes everything, but the way that it makes the personal important to a lot more other people. Uh, to a, to a bigger audience, and you know, to a lot of other people who may not have shared the same experiences, but acknowledge the humanity and how you know, um, because of that humanity that we all share, then the, this experience is something that we can sympathize and empathize with as well. Okay, so thank you all. Um, fantastic talk for a Tuesday morning, and let me just remind everyone that this is. Um, this this is actually the first um, as part of a series celebrating the 111th anniversary of the founding of the UP Department of English and Comparative Literature, and that we will be um, holding several others, um, several other roundtable discussions. So in September, we will have DECL Critics in Conversation. In December, DECL Artists in Conversation. And then um, in March of next year, we will have DECL alumni in public service, I think, uh, which is also an important um, sector no? um, in conversation. So thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, thank you to our wonderful speakers. Um, Gina, I know that you're in a different time zone. So thank you for carving out time for us as well. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Butch. Thank you so much. It's such a huge honor. I love this department. <laughs> uh, we love you. <laughs> Salamat. Thank you.